Have you heard about PBA? It's pseudobulbar effect, which can cause uncontrollable laughter or cry. I wasn't aware of this term before I encountered with someone who had this. I'm a professional swimmer, and this story is about a summer when I was just training to participate in preliminaries back in high school. It was the first day of the summer training program. Our coach, who usually trained us, was absent due to some reason, and there was supposed to be a new coach assigned for the first week of training. There were only three of us who were to arrive on the first day of the morning session. The rest of them were due to arrive within the next two days. I got to the pool early as usual and changed into my swimming gear. After doing some warm-up exercises, I went inside the pool and started doing some breaststrokes. No one else had arrived yet, but during the swimming, I suddenly heard a loud, weird laughter coming from the other side of the pool. Believe me, I felt embarrassed thinking that someone was making fun of my technique. I looked toward that direction, and a middle-aged man was staring at me and laughing without showing any other emotion on his face. All of a sudden, it stopped being embarrassing and started to become creepy. I thought of ignoring him and continued to focus on my training. But then I saw him inside the pool swimming towards me. I freaked and started to swim in the opposite direction from him. And that's when I heard Sam's voice calling me. Hey bro, you early here again? Do you even sleep at all? As I got out of the pool, I saw him waving towards me with a big smile on his face. I'll sleep after training, I said while laughing, giving my entire focus to Sam and ignoring that creepy guy. You are amazing, bro. You train four hours a day, work at night, and still look all freshened up. He laughed while admiring me. I shrugged my shoulders playfully and decided to join Sam in the pool. That man still hadn't left, and he was sitting over at a bench staring at us. It felt a bit uncomfortable, but I tried my best to ignore. He would still sometimes laugh, which would divert my attention towards him but it looked like Sam didn't notice him, so I completely ignored the man. Hey guys, Coach Gilbert called me to say that the new coach has already arrived. Have you seen him yet? Sarah, who was also one of the students and was supposed to train on the first day with us, had arrived and said while practically shouting at us because we were a bit far from her. We looked at each other, and then our glazes went toward the man from earlier. He had stood up and was looking in our direction. He bowed his head towards us and then started talking with Sarah. Guys, coach has asked for you both to finish your strokes quickly and then do 10 laps each. She was always the bossy one, but I could not figure out why he asked Sarah to tell us instead of telling us himself. He kept laughing sometimes while we were practicing, which I still could not figure out why. During the entire practice session, he would just tell Sarah about what we were supposed to do next, and he just sat there and watched us. After training, we chit-chatted a bit, and then headed towards our homes. After exiting from the club, I was still thinking about his uncontrollable laughter, which I was unable to figure out why he was doing that. At first, I thought he must be laughing at me, but then it looked like he wasn't. It must be some sort of disorder he had. I got inside my car and started to drive towards home, but it still hadn't crossed my mind that I should ask someone about it, and after reaching home, I went to the bathroom, took a clean shower, and got in bed to sleep. I checked my phone after waking up and saw messages from Coach Gilbert. He had asked me to check on the new coach in the evening, saying he was a bit shy and may end up getting bullied by college kids. I was supposed to head for work within two hours, so I thought it would not hurt checking on him on my way. I got dressed and headed outside. After that, I drove towards the club, and as I reached it, it seemed like no one was around. The club looked empty, and there were no signs of new coach as well. As I was about to leave, I heard a faint laughter combined with the sound of groaning which was coming from the pool. I went there to check, and fell back from shock and terror from what I had saw. The pool was red from the blood, and the new coach was floating with multiple cut wounds on his body. He was trying to take his last breaths. I decided to get in the pool to take him outside, but within a mere few seconds of what thought, the coach's body had drowned. He was dead. 
I was trembling with fear and couldn't reason with myself about what I was supposed to do at that moment. Then all of a sudden, I remembered that I should call 911 for help. I dialed with my trembling hands and informed them about the scene I had just witnessed. After a few minutes, the police had arrived at the scene, and I was being questioned about what I was doing there at the first place. They checked the CCTV footage, but the surveillance camera which was installed near the scene of the crime was found damaged. Hence, no footage was recorded from there. But I was clearly seen in the camera at the gate entering the club, and the new coach was also seen entering an hour earlier than me. Apart from me and the coach, no one else was captured in those footages within those time frames. So I had become a suspect of the crime due to being the only one present at the scene. His body was sent for autopsy, and now all I could do was wait for the results. I was being questioned between the time frame. No relation was found between me and the coach, so there was only the autopsy result that could tell if I killed him or not. After two days, the results were finally in, and according to them, the injuries he sustained was 15 to 20 minutes prior to the time I had reached at the pool. The police started to search for other suspects and evidences. They checked the surveillance footage multiple times when they noticed that when students were entering the club, there were seven of them, but only six of them exited the club. They checked the footage after the body was taken, and a man wearing the hoodie was seen exiting the pool after midnight. That's when I gave them the messages that Coach Gilbert had sent me about the new coach. He was called for interrogation, and during the same questioning, he broke down. He told the police that he just went there to talk to him about not taking over his position as trainer for the competitions, but the new coach kept laughing which annoyed him to the extent that he lost control and started beating him from whatever he could grab at the moment. But as soon as he realized what he had done, he got nervous and planned to frame me instead. That was when he texted me and hid the other evidences as well. Coach Gilbert was put on trial for murdering the new coach, Abraham Clint, and I was removed from the title of suspect. It was the summer which affected my life and my point of view to look at the matters and people in an extremely different way. I still sometimes wonder that laughter is not always a cure for some people, specifically with the people who suffer from disorders such as pseudo-bulbar effect. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. This happened when my sister and I were about 6 and 8. We are now 43 and 45, me being the eldest. And it is something that still haunts us occasionally. We had an amazing municipal swimming pool in our neighborhood. South Africa summers in Johannesburg are hot and long, so the swimming pool was the ultimate destination. Joe was the adult that was always at the pool. He would swim lengths, practice diving, and tickle our feet under the water. Just typing this makes me feel nauseous. To this day, I still have issues with my feet being wet. Specifically, I am unable to leave cream on my feet. The sliminess makes me claustrophobic. I only realized the connection last year. Whenever we would sit on the edge of the pool with our feet hanging in, he would swim past all of us and tickle all our feet in a row. Now I can't remember all the details, but someone playfully screamed, oh no Joe, and Joe did it again and sang, oh no Joe, not again Joe. We laughed as kids do. Then he tickled our feet again and made us sing his new song. Oh no, Joe, not again, Joe. It became a game. He would grab us under the water and we would sing. It went from feet tickling to chasing us and grabbing our waist under the water. The song never went away. One day at the pool, Joe told us that he had this amazing farm just out of town and he would like to take us to see his animals, his mealies, which is corn, and his own swimming pool. 
it sounded like heaven to all of us. He was talking to several children, boys and girls, and he told us to be at the swimming pool on Saturday, but not to tell our parents we will go in his car. As soon as we got home though, we told our dad everything as we were so excited and the farm sounded amazing. Our dad said absolutely not and asked who this Joe was anyway. We told him that he was our friend at the pool and he plays with our feet and chases us around the pool. My dad said that actually maybe we could go and he wanted to meet Joe first. Yay! The next day we went to the pool and we told Joe that we could go with him, but our dad wanted to meet him first. Joe was upset that we told our dad, but we said not to worry, our dad's cool. So Joe walked home with us. We only live about five blocks from the pool and came to meet our dad. Now Joe is about 5'6 and my dad is 6'7. The personification of a gentle giant. My dad was very polite to Joe and asked him loads of questions about the farm. Where is it exactly? How many kids are going? Has he spoken to other parents? Joe was cool as a cucumber. He answered the question smoothly and confidently, and my dad ended by saying to Joe that he looked forward to seeing him at his farm on Saturday. I think we will have a great time. I'll bring my girls though, and we will meet you there. Now the next part is a bit of a blur to me. I'm not sure how we ended up driving in convoy with about three other dads and their kids from the pool, but it was so exciting. My dad had the map book leading the convoy to the best farm in the world. We drove about an hour out of town when we arrived at a derelict farmhouse. No animals, no mallees, no swimming pools, just this run-down, isolated, scary-looking farmhouse in the middle of nowhere. I remember being really confused. My dad must have read the map book wrong. All the dads then huddled together, and we had no idea what they were saying, but they were really angry. We were angry too, as we were obviously lost, and it was the dad's fault. Everyone got back in their cars, and I started screaming at my dad about how he'd deliberately gotten us lost because he doesn't like Joe, and he didn't want us to have fun. My dad was silent and pensive, and after my tantrum, He said to my sister and I in a very calm, deep voice, Joe is a bad man. He was going to hurt all of you. He is the bad man your mom is always warning you about. My mom is obsessed with true crime. There is no farm, and I'm so happy you girls told me what was going on because something bad could have happened to you. His strong voice broke in the last word. The gravity of his tone and the break in his voice made my sister and I realize immediately that he was right and we were in danger. We cried and apologized and he made us promise to tell him if we ever saw Joe again. Joe stayed away from the pool for about a month, but as soon as we saw him come through the gate, we quickly got dressed and ran home. When my dad came home from golf, we told him Joe was at the pool again. Then the next day, we went to the pool with our dad. We were swimming, and my dad was sitting on one of the benches to the side. In walks Joe. He came to the edge of the pool and was calling to us. We refused to go to the edge, and he was getting frustrated. My dad then got up and walked over to him. Hey, buddy. Can I have a chat with you outside real quick? Joe physically shrunk. My dad had his hand on Joe's shoulder and was guiding him out to the pool. I can only imagine what my dad did and said to him. My dad is a gentleman, but don't mess with his girls. Joe was never seen again at our swimming pool. It happened last year between Christmas and New Year's Eve. I'm from the French Caribbean, so it's not unusual to scuba dive during Christmas holidays. My family and I, a 25-year-old female, booked a few dives. They're all really good scuba divers, better than me. They passed a few scuba diving levels that allowed them to participate in way more technical dives than I'm allowed to do. I enjoy scuba diving as well. 
I'm able to do almost every casual dive, but I don't feel safe diving without an instructor, yet even more if it's a dive with decompression stops required. If anyone isn't familiar with scuba diving, here's a quick explanation. You can dive safely into a certain depth before the pressure becomes dangerous. If you dive below that point, which is roughly 20 meters or 65 feet, you have to do decompression stops during your ascent. It means that you have to stop while going back to the surface at a certain time to let your body adapt itself to the pressure. If you rise up too quickly, you may catch decompression sickness, which can lead, in a worst case scenario, to death. So we decided that I could manage a little private lesson with my instructor first prior to more exciting dives with my family. So the first day my family was enjoying a dive on a technical spot that I wasn't feeling up to while I was alone with my instructor and retrieving my old scuba diving reflexes. Everything went okay. We were on a beautiful coral reef. There were many beginners on the boats. I was by far the more experienced here. So finally, my instructor decided that he could manage me with another student who was truly a beginner. After small briefing with safety rules and hand signs, which is the only way to communicate underwater, we began our descent. I quickly retrieved all my old reflexes and was enjoying myself going back and forth to the instructor and the beginner diver for at least 20 minutes. Everything was perfect besides one thing. It was a windy day and there was a heavy swell. It's less of a problem under the water than it is for surface swimmers. The only thing is that it requires more physical effort to swim, so my air bottle was emptying a little quicker than usual, which was normal. I signed to my instructor that I was running thin of air, and he nodded. It was at this level far from being critical. It was at this moment that I saw a young man swimming towards me. It wasn't the instructor nor its student. I've never seen him before, but he was in full scuba diving gear, and we were the only dive boat on the spot, so I assumed he was with us, and I just didn't pay any attention to him on the boat. He was swimming fast towards me and then signaled to me that he was out of air. When a failure happens while scuba diving, there is a very strict procedure. You have to help the person with no questions asked because every second is vital. You find on underwater gear you have breathing devices, regulators, octopus, and I'm sure about the English word, a main device and a spare device. So I handed the guy my spare breathing device, which means that we were both breathing with my gear, consuming twice as much air as I was consuming alone. I waited till the guy seemed to calm down and tried to hand sign him to go see my instructor. He nodded no and signed to me to start an ascent. I understand this procedure. I was a little low on air, above the decompression stop level, so the right thing to do was going up to the surface before having an air failure. I had to tell my instructor first. This guy was very reluctant, which was strange. It would have taken us like 30 seconds to tell the instructor and he would have started an ascent with us. During this time, I was panicking at seeing my own level going down and I saw that our instructor was staring at us quizzically and swimming towards us. It was at this moment that the guy let go of my spare air device and started swimming away, breathing again in his own breathing device. I was totally lost and started my ascent with my instructor. Once at the surface because of the tides, I was feeling dizzy and nauseous, so my bizarre encounter wasn't the first thing that I debriefed. It was after I calmed down and the boat was driving us toward the beach without the strange guy that I asked my instructor about what happened. I don't know. Maybe a guy who lost his group and needed some time to calm down. They replied, Okay. Why did he tell me that he was out of air, though? My instructor told me that I probably misunderstood his hand signal and that he was probably not telling me he was having an air failure because he left breathing in his own device. I'm sure I saw him do the air failure sign, but it was okay, I guess. The next day, I joined my family during my dive and the instructor was different. It was a girl this time, Charlie. I've had time to think about that guy, and I was worried about him. So I told everything that happened to Charlie, and asked her if she knew the guy, and if he was okay, because I didn't see him going back to the surface. She asked me to describe him, which I did. She told me, Oh, that's Marvin. Don't worry about him. 
he's preparing himself to become a scuba diving instructor. Every time he has a day off from the restaurant, he's working here. He asked us to dive him on the coral reef that morning and to pick him up in the afternoon. I ate at his restaurant this noon, Psalm. I was feeling relieved and told myself that it was just a comprehension issue with Marvin. The rest of the week went without any instant. I was doing more and more technical dives and everything went very smoothly. Charlie was a wonderful instructor and I never saw Marvin again. That is, until the last dive. It was on New Year's Eve. We planned the best dive on that day. It was on a shipwreck and I felt trained enough to try it without my instructor. Just my family and I. And it was Charlie's day off. It was fairly deep for a beginner like me. 30 meters at its down point, around 98 feet. My first day male instructor was there and told us that he would be exploring the shipwreck too. So we would cross him and help me if he saw that I needed it. It was very comforting to know and my family felt comforted when I told them that. So we began our descent and started swimming around the shipwreck. We crossed our old instructor twice, but every time I signed him that everything was okay. It was at that moment that I saw Marvin swimming toward me. At this moment, I was about five to 10 meters above my down point, but still staying under my decompression stop level. I was a little surprised and even more surprised when he signaled me again that he was out of air. I was distrustful, but if there was any chance that it would be true, I couldn't not help him. So I handed him my spare breather, but this time I had a lot of air left, so it wasn't really an issue. He took it, started breathing it in, and took my arm. I reached to see his air level instruments, but he prevented me from seeing it. Then he signed me to start in descent with him. I immediately signed no. I wasn't at my deepest when he reached, but I have been deeper during this time and I've had a decompression stop to do. I saw that my father saw us and he quickly looked away, probably not understanding what was going on. I tapped at my diving computer device, which calculates when and how long to decompress to signify it to him. He shrugged, smiled at me and started swimming up, still holding me. I was paralyzed for a few seconds. And the thing that helped me react was that my diving computer was telling me to stop and decompress now. I then understood that I was in danger and that if I'd let him do what he wanted, I would die from the bins. I then started screaming, only to remember that no noise can be heard underwater. I started wiggling frantically as I saw my father and sister way below me, my diving computer alerting me more and more intensely. At that moment, my father saw us and he reacted. He swam very quickly toward us and I managed to hit the guy as my dad grabbed my ankle and suddenly dragged me deeper. The guy then quickly swam away. My dad dragged me deeper again and then we waited for a long decompression stop to ensure that I would be okay. Then he started at heading towards the surface very slowly and cautiously. Once we reached the surface, I started crying frantically and went back to the boat. My father then told me that he thought Marvin was my old instructor and this was why he wasn't surprised at first. I then told it to my old instructor who took it more seriously this time and told me to show him Marvin when we would go up to the surface. Thing is, he never did. The next day on New Year's, we went one last time to the scuba diving club because my little sister had a diploma to collect. We saw Charlie still choked up. I told her what happened with Marvin, and then she stiffened. She told me that Marvin was at the restaurant yesterday for New Year's Eve, and he didn't go scuba diving, which means that this guy wasn't Marvin. And to this day, I still don't know who he is, or what he wanted, or why he tried to kill me, maybe twice. <laughs>